I'm very happy to be joining you virtually at the Stoicon X Brisbane conference for 2019, largely focused on Epictetus. So I took as the title and subject for this talk, one really key idea and practice of Epictetus that's at the core of Stoic philosophy. That is keeping one's pro in accordance with nature. And I'm going to talk about a few different things in this, a bit of history, um, what exactly is this thing pro that we're mentioning, what does in accordance with nature mean. Um, I'm going to give you a few examples from common life and that Epictetus himself brings up, and then talk about um, what, it, what it really means to keep our pro in accordance with nature by using our faculty of pro the faculty of choice, to work on itself. Before that though, let's, let's actually take a look at one of the key passages where this arises. This is in uh, chapter four of the Enchiridion. I've got the Loeb edition here, so it's a little bit old timey translation, it's old father. So, and, and it runs like this. When you are on the point of putting your hand to some undertaking, remind yourself what the nature of that undertaking is. If you're going out of the house to bathe, Put before your mind what happens at a public bath. Those who splash you with water, those who jostle against you, those who vilify you and rob you. And thus you will set about your undertaking more securely if at the outset you say to yourself, I want to take a bath and at the same time to keep my moral purpose, proeracis, in accordance with nature. And do so in every undertaking. For thus, if anything happens to hinder you in your bathing, you will be ready to say, oh, well, this was not the only thing that I wanted, but I wanted to keep my moral purpose in harmony with nature, and I shall not so keep it if I am vexed at what is going on. Now, we don't go to public baths all that often, but we can practice this in so many other circumstances. And we've got two key ideas here. We've got that of moral purpose, which is the translation here for pro racist And we've got this in harmony with nature or in accordance with nature. And... Um, both of these are, are central concepts in Stoic philosophy. The one more in Epictetus and the one running throughout the entire Stoic tradition. Um, I think that both of these terms require a little bit of examination or analysis, but for different reasons. When it comes to this term proiracis, this Greek term, right? There's no perfect translation for it. And we might be tempted to, you know, shy away from it a bit in part because of, it seems too difficult. We have to be on guard against getting it wrong and mistranslating it. Um, and it, you know, here are some of the translations, faculty of choice, moral purpose, will, state of character, uh, moral character, mind, volition. These are all different ways of rendering this term. On the other hand, in accordance with nature, it's a little bit too easy in some respects, right? Because we all know what nature is, but we might not have the same idea that the Stoics themselves had of nature. So we wanna take a look at, at both of these. And I'm gonna go through a little bit of history first. Let's start with the term that we're all familiar with, nature, right? And this notion of being in accordance with nature, in harmony with nature, it's not unique to the Stoics. As a matter of fact, it plays a central role in pretty much all of the virtue ethics of the ancient world. You even see it popping up outside of the Western sphere in other places as well. Um, we do know that Zeno himself, the founder of Stoicism, wrote a work on life according to nature and a on choice or on human nature. So it's unfortunate that we We've lost those. We also know that this doctrine of what is in accordance with nature was discussed in considerable detail. How, how do we know that? Well, you know, we've got these sources to draw upon. Diogenes Laertes, The Lives of the Philosophers, Book 7, is all about the Stoics. Uh, Cicero tells us quite a bit. Arius Didymus's Epitome of Stoic Ethics also tells us quite a bit. And they give us not only detailed discussions of what the Stoics meant by this, but 
but show us that there was a ongoing development of doctrine so that Zeno said one thing and then Cleanthes added something, Chrysippus added some more, Diogenes added some more, Antipater, and we go on and on and on. Um, the later Stoic thinkers, the ones whose works we actually possess, Seneca, Musonius Rufus, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, Herocles, um, some of these in more fragmentary ways than others, they make constant reference and applications and occasionally explanations of what it means to be in accordance with nature. So we're going to look at some of those. By the time that Epictetus is talking about this, this is a long familiar Stoic doctrine. And um, he uses a wide vocabulary. Sometimes he talks about being in accordance with nature or harmonizing with nature. Sometimes he talks about following nature or participating in nature. What about this other term, proeresis? So this is a term that, again, is, is not original to Epictetus or to Stoicism either. It's used um, by a number of different authors. Uh, you know, the, the orators, Demosthenes and Isocrates, use it to talk about a sort of choice of way of life. Um, there's others as well who, who use it in, in speeches. Plato mentions it at one point. Aristotle uses it quite, quite uh, extensively in his work. And you could say that in ancient times, Epictetus and Aristotle are the two people who use this term the most. Um, then there's others who, who use it um, talking about uh, similar things. Plutarch will bring it up in the lives and in various moral treatises. Stoic philosophers until the time of Epictetus don't appear to use it all that much. They, they use it in its sort of lexical form. So pro is before or in place of, right? Uh, when we talk about prioritization, it's got that kind of sense to it. And then hyresis literally is grabbing, you know, you're grabbing on to something, you're gripping it, and, and you're taking it. So prohyresis is, is, in some respect, taking one thing before another. But you can think of it as taking one thing in place of another, or prioritizing, setting one thing above another. And in Epictetus, it's going to take on this much, much wider extension. As a matter of fact, you could say that there's probably nobody in ancient times who uses this term uh, to mean as much as Epictetus does. So what then does Epictetus mean by this term proeresis that we've seen is, is so important in his work? Um, there's a number of different ways that we can look at this if we're, you know, examining it from multiple perspectives that we're getting from the Enchiridion and the discourses. And I think one that could be helpful right at the start is to think about it in terms of what's in our power and what's not in our power. Familiar to uh, most of you, I'm sure, is the dichotomy of control. Um, it's also connected to this notion of what's internal and external, right? Uh, external things, ta'ekta, are not in our, our power, not in our control. Uh, hemon, right? Uh, in Greek. So what, what is actually within our power? That tells us what the scope of the priorasis is. What does Epictetus tell us? If you look at Enchiridion 1, desire and aversion, right? Uh, erexis and ecclesis. Um, this would also include the emotions, the pathe, uh, choice and refusal, horme and aporme, right? And also what we do with those choices and refusals in terms of duties or the kathekon. Uh, a sense, the, the actual agreeing to things, taking them on, that's within our power as well. Assumptions, hupolepses, Opinions or judgments, dogma, uh, krima, krinein in, in Greek. Um, the preparation that we make is also something that Epictetus says is in our power. And the purposes that we set before us, the place that you would want to look at for that would be Book 4, Chapter 11. And Epictetus even uses this term thalane, which, which means willing or, or you know, choosing. 
And another key thing that's encompassed by this, what is in our power, is the use or dealing with the chresis in Greek of externals, of appearances, all those sorts of things. Those fall within our, our, our power, our control. They are our business. They're up to us. That means that they fall within the scope of the proeresis. And the earlier Stoics also wrote quite a bit about the good and bad being virtue and vice. Um, that, you know, lying within our power, you can read that into Epictetus. He doesn't talk as often about virtue and vice as others. But Epictetus tells us over and over and over again that the good and the bad lie within the scope of the proeresis. So what is good for us? What is bad for us? That is something that is up to us. And he tells us um, over and over again what we ought to do. So he says, when we encounter appearances or other matters that you know seem to be an issue for us, we apply a rule. Is it outside of the province of moral purpose or proi racis, or is it inside? And then we can say, not only is the proi racis this domain of things that we have some control over, some say in, it's also a kind of unity. It's a unity within the person themselves. It's what you are. And so for Epictetus, he says that it's the very core of the, the human being. Another way of understanding this is that it's the hegemonicon. It's the ruling part of you. So he says at one point in, in uh, book three, you are not flesh, not hair, but moral purpose. If you get that beautiful, you will be beautiful. So this, this faculty that we have for choosing, for selecting, for committing ourselves. There's also what we can call a reflexivity uh, to proiresis. He says that not even Zeus can hinder it. Only, only we can. He says nothing outside of the sphere of proiresis or moral purpose can hamper or injure it. It alone can hamper or injure itself. At one point, he, this is in book one in chapter 17, he says that proiresis compelled proiresis. So how did it do so? Through what it chose to think about. This is probably starting to gel in a lot of your minds at this point. Um, proiresis is not only this reflexive that it works upon itself, this reflexive faculty, it's also the locus of our freedom, what freedom we actually do possess. We use our freedom to determine what our freedom is going to mean, what we're going to do with it. And so how does this proiresis act upon itself or determine itself? Well, partly through cognitive means, partly through what we choose to think about, how we choose to think about things. Do we, for example, uh, think about ourselves as having been insulted or do we realize, as Epictetus tells us, that the insult really lies in our judgment? and not in the person doing the insulting. We also do it through the practical reshaping of uh, desire and aversion, of choice and refusal, the first two topoi or fields of philosophy, according to Epictetus, right? We um, do it through the creation and destruction and the weakening and strengthening of habits, the redirection of the habits that we have. And we also do it by continual attention to the choices that have to be made. Now, one of those key choices is exactly what we're talking about here. Do we choose to focus on what it was that we wanted in the situation or do we choose to focus on keeping our pro racist in accordance with nature? That's a central question for the pro racist. Okay then, so then what does it mean to be in accordance with nature when it comes to Stoic philosophy and the pro racist? One key idea, and this is there from the very start, is being part of this larger whole that is the cosmos. But we can also think of it not only as you know the entire universe, we might think about it as our particular community, or we might you know zero in a little bit closer. This is almost like taking Heracles' circles, and, and Heracles wants us to bring the outside in. Maybe we should concentrate on the inside a bit. Think about our 
close circles of friends and families and you know extended a bit to co-workers or fellow uh, citizens of a particular place we're part of something else we're not the totality ourselves that we're tempted to think we are we're not the center of the universe we are a part of it. Epictetus says this. Marcus brings this home even more in, in his own works. So accepting our, our fate, accepting things as they turn out to be, um, physical processes which are vulnerable to break up and things like that, that's part of being in accordance with nature. If I expect that I'm going to live in this body forever, or even that this shirt is gonna survive forever, I'm really setting myself up for a lot of problems. And so to be in accordance with nature means to see things as they genuinely are. Um, Seneca says something kind of along these lines when he says that nature wishes our laws to be identical with her own. What else does it mean to be in accordance with nature? Here's where there was a very interesting difference. Cleanthes thought that being in accordance with nature meant being in accordance with the totality of the universe. Chrysippus insisted that it not only meant that, but also being in accordance with human nature. This is where sometimes modern points of view can lead us astray because we often attribute bad things to human nature. We say, oh, you know, somebody stole from me. Well, let's use the example of the bathhouse again, right? Somebody is going to splash water on you, jostle you, vilify you and rob you, right? Insult you and steal your stuff. Take your towel, take your, your wallet, whatever it happens to be. Um, we often say, oh, well, that's human nature. People are just bad. That's not the way the Stoics saw that. They would say that is degenerate human nature. As a matter of fact, Epictetus uses all sorts of metaphors of human beings who've been transformed or allowed themselves to sink to the level of animals, whether it be uh, you know, uh, sheep pursuing pleasure, uh, birds and beasts of prey who are angry all the time, or other things, stupid asses as well. Really pursuing human nature means a fully developed human nature, a social nature, a rational nature. That's what we should be in accordance with. Um, beyond that, there are some very specific injunctions about what it means to be in accordance with nature. Musonius Rufus, Epictetus' teacher, gives us some examples of that that we might not agree with. Like, for example, he says, being a farmer is the occupation most in accordance with nature. I'm not sure that that's necessarily so but there are quite a few things like this some of them are kind of culturally bound as well so epictetus um, will suggest that gender roles need to be acknowledged that's part of nature and i would be in good stead because i've got a nice beard um, those of you who are men out there who don't have beards epictetus wouldn't like that so much some of that we might want to put aside or we might want to rethink. And we want to focus on the general things. What, what else can we say is in accordance with nature? Epictetus insists over and over and over again, using appearances or impressions, fantasiae, in accordance with nature is central. What does that mean? That means not necessarily accepting them at face value, questioning them, seeing whether they really amount to anything, not giving assent to them immediately. He also talks about using external things in accordance with nature. He talks about excessive emotions as being contrary to nature. And this is, you know, common Stoic doctrine. Doesn't mean, by the way, that we can't have emotions, um, but they should be in accordance with reason. They should be rational. Um, one particularly interesting example is natural affection, philostorgia. Uh, Epictetus says that that is something that is in accordance with nature as well, to feel affection towards those who we are connected with. Let's consider a very short list of examples in order to, to stick to time for this, this presentation. So I mentioned philostorgia or familial affection. There's a really great discussion in the discourses where Epictetus is talking with this, this guy who's a dad, and he says, how's, how's uh, family life treating you? And the dad says, oh, it's terrible. My daughter got sick and I was so affected by familial affection, I had to leave. I couldn't be in the same room as her because I was so worried about her. And Epictetus says, wait, you, you, you left her? You left your sick kid? 
uh, that's not familial affection. That's not actually in accordance with nature. Whatever you're feeling, buddy, that was something else. Uh, the people who stuck around, like you, you know, your wife and the nurse, they were actually acting naturally. You weren't acting naturally at all. Um, another great example is in uh, book three of the discourses, Epictetus talks about news. And he says that news on any subject never falls within the sphere of the proiresis. So uh, it's never actually good or bad news. News can't be in accordance with nature, not in accordance with nature. But you can keep your uh, proiresis, your faculty of choice or moral purpose in accordance with nature by not like chasing after the news, by not giving into it, by not giving it too much importance. Um, another, you know, prime example is the bathhouse that we were just discussing. When you go to the public swimming pool, um, you can either keep your, your proiresis in accordance with nature by adjusting to things as they are and reminding yourself that keeping your cool is what's really important to you. Not that you get to have, I don't know, the best place in the hot tub or that, you know, no kids run around screaming or anything like that or there isn't a slippery place, uh, you know, because people left water or anything like that. That's, that's going to happen. People are going to play their music. People are going to scream. People are going to uh, interrupt whatever activities you're engaged with. If you're doing laps, somebody will get in your way. You have a choice, though, about what you do to keep your faculty of choice, your proiresis, in accordance with nature. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the other things that he has to say about this. Um, choosing rightly, this is a really central thing. We're not only choosing how we're reacting to things, we're choosing whether we value proiresis, this central part of ourselves, more than these other external things. So it's not just a choice between two alternatives, it's a choice about how we commit or prioritize. He tells us that we should transfer our judgments that lie within the province of moral purpose, and then we'll be steadfast no matter what happens. He says that honoring anything outside of the scope of moral purpose destroys it or wrecks it. So we want to be careful with what we do with our proiresis. A little bit later in the end, Caridian, when he's talking about the ruling faculty, he says we ought to be careful, like somebody who's trying not to step on a nail, that we don't damage our ruling faculty. We have to keep this in mind, and that's an important technique. Every situation that we go into, the stakes are higher than they first appear. Every time we're posed with a chance to make things better for ourselves or to make things worse, and that's up to us. A lot of this has to do with what Epictetus calls right you know, use or proper use, crisis, dealing with things. Um, he says that we ought to be, uh, we should be cautious or exert caution towards the things that are within the scope of the proiresis, but be confident towards the outside. There's a really wonderful discussion of this in um, Book 2, Chapter 1. Um, we also have this great metaphor of playing the game, the game, the ball game that Socrates did when it comes to the right use of external things and rightly using appearances. We mentioned this a little bit earlier. That means not immediately assenting to them, assessing them, employing and developing criteria for, for you know, determining what's really going on. Another really key thing I think that, that um, Epictetus drives home perhaps more than any of the other Stoic authors that we have is how important roles and duties are. Um, roles, as he says, reveal to us what our duties are, sometimes even the mere word, father, son, child, co-worker, uh, spouse. They tell us how we ought to be behaving. And to do those things is to, to be in accordance with nature. To do so willingly is to have our proiresis in accordance with nature. We have general and individual standards depending on what it is. He also talks about maintaining the person within you, the person of good character. 
This comes up in the context of Epictetus telling somebody who is caught in adultery, buddy, there's nothing I can do with you. You're damaged goods. You need to get the hell out of here. Now, that may be a bit harsh, right? We, we might want to have some, some possibility of redemption for such a person. But um, Epictetus thinks that when we choose the wrong things, again, we're not just choosing those individual options, we are choosing something that bears upon our moral character, bears upon the core of who we are. Um, so these are some, some important things to keep in mind. Um, the last thing that I'll say, I, I think Epictetus also stresses, and this is quite important, especially for us today in the present, spread out all across the world, that we ought to look for genuine friends. He's got a very, in a wonderful chapter on friendship in book two of the discourses. And he talks about genuine friends are those who see the proiresis and keeping proiresis in accordance with nature as the good. So if we share in that, regardless of, you know, what other circumstances we run into, we're going to have a lasting, genuine friendship that will allow us to support what we're doing. Very often, Stoicism is presented as like the lone person against the world. But I don't think that actually matches the way that Epictetus and earlier Stoics portrayed the Stoic life, which is a social life, a life lived uh, in community with others. So those are some, some uh, ideas about uh, what it means to have your proi racist in accordance with nature. Hopefully this has been thought provoking. I look forward to your questions. I'll just mention that I do also have, if you want to go a little bit further into this, two videos that I'll send links to that might be useful for you. One is from the Midwest Seminar in Ancient and Medieval Philosophy, uh, and it's specifically on proi racist and Epictetus. The other is uh, a lecture that I gave at the Center for Ethics and entrepreneurship about what in accordance with nature means for the Stoics. So if you want additional stuff, those would be good to uh, take a look at, but uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions here over the next half an hour or so.